Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll be discussing the importance of children's museums with special, with special guests, Melissa Kaiser, CEO at, at Discovery Children's Museum in Las Vegas. Uh, Aileen uh, Hefferin, uh, CEO and director of the Children's Museum of Manhattan, and Sarah Cole, CEO of the Glazer Children's Museum in Tampa, Florida. So we have Las Vegas, Manhattan, and Tampa together on the same program. I'd like to just sort of set this up by predicating our discussion um, with, with the idea that children's museums help children develop uh, skills through hands-on learning and also forge connections between children, their families, other families, and the learning experience. So if, if we could start by sort of taking stock of, of where we are in the state of the art of children's museums and in the self-guided experience provided by museums. Melissa, could you paint us a picture of what happens when a child and their family walk into your museum in Las Vegas? Well, thank you, Mark. So glad to be here. Wow. Well, we're in Las Vegas. This is a show business town. This is a, a place where the expectation of our visitors is, is very high from a customer service standpoint. So for us, the orchestration of opening the doors, having a, a, one of our staff members greet the kids and say, are you ready? You know, to the line that's forming out the door um, into a three-story space that, as you mentioned, is open-ended and, and kids get to make all about their day. But really, it's so much about the staff. It's so much about the training and the reception that they're able, able to give to every guest, um, whether it's we have a large Hispanic uh, population here in Las Vegas. So we have a lot of bilingual um, educators, uh, visitors um, that you know need a little more orientation, um, special needs uh, visitors. So um, with 26,000 square feet of space, you can imagine it's a lot of ground to cover, but there's a real wow factor when you walk in. We have a, a three-story summit climber right through the center of the museum that draws the kids right in. So, so that initial hook is, is a big part of how we get visitors uh, having a great time coming back and telling others. I love, I love your reference to show business, right? Because it really is entertainment and that sort of entryway and how you, how you experience that as a child and having enough visual um, feedback and then being able to go wherever you want. Uh, Aileen, how, how do you ensure that, that children have that initial um, charge um, that, that really sets the stage for the, the rest of the day? Well, I think what Melissa was saying is sort of the anticipation of the arrival and the you know tremendous excitement. And you think about you know little three year olds, two year olds, four year olds, eight year olds, and that anticipation for us, it's coming up a ramp uh, and standing in line. And, and now with COVID, you know, waiting for your timed entry and then having to show your vaccination status. So we're aware of like the excitement. Um, and then children handle that differently. There are some who are raring to go and can't wait to get in, and there are some who are already melting down. And that we're wanting to, um, you know, support kids wherever they are. And I think that that's really, you know, some of the beauty of the Children's Museum is that, you know, you mentioned a minute ago, Melissa, the, you know, kids with special needs is that I think that our museums are able to cater to children with so many different learning styles and whether they're, you know, have special needs or not. You need that like sort of that excitement and that drama and that thrill. And you also need to find places that are sort of like a little bit more quieter where you can tuck aside and be able to re regroup um, and experience it in different ways. So I'm sure there's kids who are immediately like pulling out of their you know, parent or caregiver's hand to scramble up that climber. And there are other ones who are going to want to stand and watch. And they may be getting as much out of that experience you know, as the child who's already up to the top, you know, maybe much of their parents' um, chagrin as the one who's standing and, and fully taking it in. And that's how they're, um, you know, they're absorbing and enjoying and appreciating the, you know, the experience uh, for, for them. You know, it's interesting when you talk about the child who stands back, right? Um, your staffs uh, need to be very sensitive to that. And sometimes, Sarah, um, when you see a child who is standing back, your your staff will approach mm -hmm. and will will engage in a gentle way 
right? So you have this, this tremendous expertise. It's something that we really don't think about, right? And we don't necessarily appreciate or compensate for it. If, if you look at somebody walking into an automobile showroom, right? We have the same behaviors reflected, but we have higher paid people who come in and cultivate that, that, uh, that customer because there's money on the line. But when a child's education is on the line, there is a even higher degree of expertise that is required, but we don't necessarily think about that, nor do we necessarily have the wherewithal to compensate it. Um, how do you cultivate a staff that has that kind of sensitivity? Uh, at your museum in in Tampa, uh, that's that's an amazing question. And you know, Aileen, I love your you said it so well about you know. I think adults have an expectation of what a child should do, and you know, one of the big things for us has been really a shift towards being as child focused as possible. And you know, starting with our staff by saying, you know, yes the family has expectations and the parents have expectations and the teachers have expectations, but our job is to serve the child. And so really getting on their level, working with them, you know, I think to your point, Mark, about having, you know, I think it's important to have a staff that reflects the audience that you serve in all kinds of ways. And so having neurodiverse staff members has been a huge asset for us in having staff members who will say, I know what that child is going through right now because I go through it when I go to Bush Gardens or I go somewhere else. And so Did you define neural diverse in this yeah. sense. This is a one that's just so wonderful. It's such a wonderful point. Yeah. So, um, you know, we, you know, neurodiversity as anyone who's kind of brain works a little differently. Um, you know, it includes things like ADHD. It includes um, it specifically autism and, you know, related disorders and related diseases. But we have several staff who self-identify as autistic and have openly identified as they are autistic. I identify as neurodiverse myself. And um, a lot of us have children who are neurodiverse. And so I think having that kind of representation within our staff has been really, really helpful in, um, in helping all of our families really um, engage in a, in a sensitive way and, and also helping those parents see, see their child in a staff member becomes a really amazing moment. So you, you have, it's, it's interesting the dynamic that comes in. You also have the dynamic of, of, of families and parents, right? And guardians and friends you don't necessarily know what the child's circumstance is. You don't know whether they're coming in with, with a traditional family or a non-traditional family or, or some sort of other arrangement that, that provides a sort of supportive environment. So how do you, when, you, when you're encountering people, how do you ensure that the child feels like this is just the most, they're, they're part of this, this group of other children. They're having a common experience. They're not being uh, singled out. How do you engage with the family, Melissa? How do your, how do your people ensure that you're meeting everyone uh, where they are and listening and learning? Because you're learning on the spot about that, that child, that, that family. For our team, it really starts with sensitivity training, lots of sensitivity training, um, diversity training, um, and get us gathering feedback from our stakeholders about their visitor experience so that we can always continuously learn how to do a better job of making every visitor feel welcome at our museum. Putting bilingual signage throughout the museum was a big step um, that we took, especially in our toddler areas where um, the parents need a little more power to help them um, understand what they're learning, what they're teaching. And, um, and to Sarah's point, just having diversity on the floor where you have the, the child that um, will open up um, to, to one of our, our educators. Um, all of our floor staff are trained educators. They have backgrounds and degrees in science, technology, art, engineering, and math. Um, they are um, educators in the presenter sense in a way that kids are very drawn to them. So um, we let those relationships happen organically, of course. It's a sensitive line. There's, you know, many parents who don't know how to play with their children or don't know how to engage in the gallery. So it, it takes that sensitivity of offering help and building trust that, that we're not trying to impose anything on the family, but that we're there. 
So you're in the entertainment business, right, Eileen? You're, you, you, um, Eileen, you're in the you're in the hospitality business, right, mm-hmm. Sarah? You're mm-hmm. in the education business. You're in the customer service business, right? This is an incredibly sophisticated operation, Eileen. When when you're working in in an environment like Manhattan, where you have a huge number of choices in a very compressed space, and you are competing for attention, how do you function in a way, you know, in in terms of that sort of sense of competitive, being a competitive business Mm -hmm. to ensure that you are attracting your share of the audience? How do you compete? Um, when you're so close to other organizations that are also trying to entice those those hours, those customer hours into their doors? No, I think it's a great question. And it's certainly there are many, you know, I think wonderfully many more opportunities, you know, for, for families with young children that existed, you know, even I now have teenagers, you know, when, when my boys uh, were little. And so I think that what we as children's museums offer what distinguishes us is that we're really this research backed, you know, in in terms of our exhibitions and what we're offering and that we are able to work with families, you know, with children from so many different backgrounds. And we're talking in terms of, you know, learning styles, you know, culturally, you know, socioeconomically, so that they're able to access it. And because we have these trained educators, which, you know, I echo what, you know, what Sarah and Melissa were saying about that, that I think that that's what families value um, in this experience. And, and frankly, because of all of our, you know, you know, dedication to outreach work, that this is a space where people from so many different, um, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds are able to access that you wouldn't necessarily see, you know, in a pay for play space. I mean, obviously we have, you know, we charge admissions, we, you know, we need to, you know, keep, you know, keep the lights on and all that, but we also um, give away, you know, wonderfully, you know, a, a number of free passes, whether that's through, you know, deep partnerships with, that we have with say Department of Corrections, you know, Department of Homeless Services, you know, Department of education um, and, and you know different cities have things like cool culture passes that you know cater to families you know are in a uh, part of head start programs so i think that that is also what distinguishes us and that you know in a place like new york city people want their children exposed to people from all different backgrounds and they know that they can find that in a place um, like you know the children's museum where they're going to get it's going to be fun while they're learning um, uh, and they know they're going to be well supported and and, and not just as you know, Sarah was saying, like, we're here to serve the children, but I think it's, it's also been pointed out, we're really helping the adults help the children, right? And that I think some of that is really we're helping to empower the adults because a lot of times, I mean, I felt like I was just trying to keep my head above water when I had, like, when my boys were little and I didn't know what they were doing. And so when I would bring them to, you know, the children's museum to see mom, they would run around and push every button there was. And I'm thinking, oh, no, no, they should stop and they should read this and they should do this. And no, they shouldn't. They should run around because that's who those two boys were. And another child is going to stand back and stand in the corner and watch it all. And to have the educator come to come over and say, look what he's taking in. Look how he's observing all that. Look at how he's processing that. It's tremendously you know, empowering to a parent. So I think that that's what, as children's museums, we're able to do for families that distinguishes us from you know, many other options that are out there for, for families. Sarah, are you communicating your the, the, the value proposition? I saw you, I saw you nodding while um, Aileen were, was talking. Do you um, systematically communicate your value proposition in this way that you are you're actually providing training for parents you're you're giving more time to individual children you're able to segment a little bit more by observed experience than you can in a structured classroom are you communicating to uh, your various constituents including your funders including your community partners that value proposition and how do you do that how do you make sure that they understand the value that you bring to each and every person who walks through your door? That's a fantastic question. I would say we are, we're working towards that. You know, I think we, I know, I'd love to say, yes, perfectly, we're doing that, but we're not perfect at it yet by any stretch of the imagination. Um, But it's been a huge focus for us of, um, you know, starting with our board members, starting with our volunteers and some of our closest partners in funding of, you know, bringing them to the table around learning about, you know, about play and about what play actually does, but 
you know, about what child focused and child driven play looks like. And, um, you know, kind of helping to unpack some of the things that they have misconceptions about, about our space. Um, and, um, you know, we've had, I just met with a board member last night who it was wonderful the way he was telling me about, you know, how he learned so much and he went home and he talked to his wife and, you know, I lean exactly to your point of, and now my kids are, they're going around the house and they're making such a mess, but instead of getting mad, he's like, I get a little mad, but I realize that they're playing and I realize what they're doing and they're growing. And, you know, right now we're doing it on a one-to-one basis. And our goal is to figure out how to scale that, how to get to a point where our entire community can, can see those things and can start to hear that and grasp that. So you move parents from don't do that to do that some more. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully. And, you know, I think part of it is us also helping parents realize that we're not expecting them to be perfect. We're not expecting, you know, yeah, it's when your kid gets a thing of chocolate syrup out of the fridge to go do science, it's incredibly frustrating and you're going to get mad about it. But, you know, (laughs) as you're cleaning up the chocolate syrup to say, but let's think about what he learned. Let's think about what he did in this moment. And, you know, maybe it's worth a little bit of time on scrubbing. <laughs> so we just completed a, a poll in which we, we asked um, which areas of learning uh, does the Children's Museum advance most? And uh, roughly 40% each said uh, physical uh, and neuromotor coordination and um, intellectual analysis and uh, problem solving. Um, with about 20, uh, 25% saying uh, social interactions and uh, cooperation. So you have a, 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 a real balanced view of how these organizations uh, add value. But I'd like to get a little bit behind the scenes. So if kids are, are doing stuff in a space, it's going to break. Right. You're going to have a lot of stuff that that needs to be maintained, needs to be made made safe. And safety is a big, big part. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to go around the room and just talk about safety, particularly in this time of COVID. Could you each share how you're um, encountering uh, people and what you're experiencing, what your staff is experiencing as you're as you're um, you're uh, promulgating your respective policies? Uh, Melissa, what are you doing in uh, Las Vegas? Yeah, and it's a great question. It's a very varied question um, across the country. We have it at the the national level um, with with our peers on a weekly basis. Um, But in Las Vegas, um, we have kept the masks requirement throughout the entire pandemic um, for all visitors ages two and older. Um, So really everyone. And um, even when mask mandates were relieved um, and left up to businesses, we made the decision to keep our masks um, because our audience was um, under 12 and unable to get a vaccine. To your point, safety is one of our core values, you know, physical safety, health, health is a major part of that. Um, And, you know, our staff really needed training to communicate the message as to why the masks, because it was, it is a ceaseless question um, and uh, challenging for our frontline staff to have to become mass police. But having that that reason um, makes it so much easier. Um, well, I won't say it, it won't say it's have vaccines right now, so they are particularly vulnerable, right. right? Right. So that that was really our you know rationale for for keeping the mask. But but so many other safety measures. Um, Sarah was really instrumental to helping our museum reopen um, when we had to submit a reopening plan to the state with all of the mitigations, all of the exhibits we had to take off the floor, the plexiglass, the HEPA air filtration, the, you know, the continuous cleaning, um, and then having our audience feel safe about what we were doing as well so that they would want to come through our threshold. So it was a lot of marketing and promotion just to try to share that we are trying to provide a safe environment where kids can get that socio-emotional interaction they were missing from doing Zoom classrooms and have hands-on learning. And I think parents came away with feeling like we are not just a nicety in the community, but a necessity, um, especially when schools were shut down. So the safety piece, um, we did not see our numbers drop because we required masks. Um, We actually had a stronger 
summer um, than we did in 2019, and that was with masks. So, so you so you so, kept your your facility open when others were shutting theirs. You you went to masks uh, very quickly, Sarah. Um, we've we've seen a lot in the news about the Florida debates about masks, not masks, and so on. Uh, what did you experience, and how have you uh, Im- implemented your policies? Yeah, we've. I mean, we've had some flex in our policies. When we when we first reopened, um, you know, we were one of the first children's museums nationally to reopen, um, and it was, you know, a little bit of forging a path with the machete through the wilderness. But um, you know, I think we have continued to be flexible. Um, we did go to masks strongly suggested when. Um, when the CDC came out with their statement about masks not required for vaccination, because we saw a massive decrease in compliance at that point. Really what we were looking at is, you know, it's one thing to have someone wear a mask when they first come in. And we had a lot of great compliance at that ticket counter. Great. Yep. Got my mask on. And once they were about 10 feet past the counter, the masks came off and, um, and our staff to that point of being mask police, um, you know, we surveyed our staff and, you know, asked a couple questions. How safe do you feel with unmasked guests in the building? And how safe do you feel talking to someone about wearing their mask appropriately? And what we found was the mental health burden of being the mask police outweighed their concerns about their physical health. And um, and that was really part of our decision to, to stay with a highly suggested. Um, as Delta has kicked back up, you know, where we have not gone back to a mandate, um, there's a lot of like there's a lot of debate and a lot of vitriol um, about masks that we're trying to cautiously walk around. Um, we are not selling masks anymore. We are giving them to any person who walks in the door who doesn't need a mask. In the beginning, we had to sell them because the supply chains were so bad. We were losing a ton of money on masks. But um, you know, anyone who wants a mask can get a paper mask on their way in the door. Um, all of our staff are required to wear them front and back of house. Um, we are not mandating vaccines, but we are tracking and incentivizing vaccines for our staff. And so, you know, and then any any child that comes in to our care, so anyone who's here for camp or a drop off class or something like that, masks are absolutely required. We drew that line of when we're acting in loco parentis, the masks have to be required for the child. But when they are with their own family, we have to, we're going to allow the family to make that decision. Well, I love, I love what you're saying. You're basically um, trying to walk a line of respect uh, and listening, but also setting some constraints where your staff who are interacting with a lot of uh, children and uh, some of those children just cannot be vaccinated and it's very difficult to become the mask police. So you're, you're saying keep yourself safe, yeah. keep others safe as well. Um, And so you have some standards that are that are flexible, but also tied back to a logic of caring. Uh, Aileen, how how are you approaching this and how have you? No, I think it's it's definitely interesting to hear. And I think it's so much, as you said, like dependent on the area of the country. So, I mean, I think that with our team, uh, you know, there's it's the concern about their own safe and, you know, being in New York city, you know, being in Manhattan. Uh, But also I think it's for other families. Uh, And then what we were finding was that um, other families were also concerned where masks would slip, you know? And so we would, but we always, again, going back to the training. And so we did de-escalation training last fall. We did de-escalation training and, and wanting it to be done like in a joyful way. So when we talk about six feet apart, it's the helicopter arms. It's, you know, it's, and again, you're hiring people to be your educators who are warm and friendly and you want to make this like exciting and fun. So instead of saying you can't come in because you don't have your mask on, it's as soon as you put your mask on, we'll be able to go on to the climber. Would you like to see Alfie today? You know, so it's all like sort of trying to do it in joyful ways. And I think that our team, um, you know, we're, we're, since we reopened in October, we're requiring masks of everyone. And now um, being in New York City, there's a, you know, an executive order that um, you have to be vaccinated if you're able to be in orders, not only to come into, you know, we're considered indoor entertainment into, you know, a museum, but also that our staff also have to be um, vaccinated. And that is, you know, you're making a very interesting point about the de-escalation training, because one of the things that that has been very clear, uh, given the um, attention that has been uh, 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 provided to uh, what law enforcement officers 
are encountering. Yeah. What you're saying is that the trauma of trying to adjudicate amongst people with different opinions as they come into your institutions, and it'll be true for art museums or, or uh, science museums or natural history museums, right? You have to have a certain amount of skill at the front door to try and, and get the conversation into a, into a place where compromise is possible, where, and you've got like this little microcosm here of, of America. It, it really does show how important these keystone institutions are, each in their respective place to the whole social fabric. Um, one of the things that we've just asked in a, in a, uh, in a uh, question that is going on right now is, have you been to a museum of any kind since the beginning of the pandemic? And uh, 36% of people have said um, so far, uh, no, they haven't. Are, have, have, did you see uh, numbers drop off um, at each of you in your communities? And uh, since, your, since your financial model is so dependent on, on attendance, whether it's through contributed revenue because people are supporting people who can, who can come in for a reduced cost or through the sales at, at the gate, um, how have you you fared financially um, through the vagaries of attendance here, Sarah? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's been a hard year. It's been a very hard year. We we saw precipitous drop off in our attendance um, for the first, you know, two thirds of this past fiscal year. Starting in about April, we really started to see recovery. And I think, Melissa, to your point, while we did not beat 2019, we were definitely on par with 2019. Um, we also, in not you know hindsight being what it is in january of 2020 we had actually raised our front gate prices and so we got a whopping you know six weeks of run out of that and then nothing so this summer with those you know our revenues actually were higher our earned revenues were higher year over year for the summer because our ticket prices were higher and that just kind of worked out that way which was really nice to be able to get that recovery but yeah we've definitely seen uh, taken a hit i think the other thing is and I don't know about, you know, YouTube, but a lot of our fundraising model has been wrapped into events for many years and the inability to hold galas and to hold fundraising events. Um, we had a hard time transitioning mentally some of our donors from that event model to something to giving to programs, to giving to help, you know, support the ongoing operation of the institution. And so, um, you know, it's been a bit of a slog, but we're confident going into our current fiscal year and really moving into, you know, what we see is recovery and in, in kind of, you know, I know we're all tired of the phrase, the new normal, but that's what it is now. And Melissa, you've got a particular situation in Las Vegas, right? You have citizens of Las Vegas who are serving the various hospitality uh, industries, and they really rely on this as a keystone institution, an educational institution. Then you have visitors to Las Vegas who's, you know, they're they're going to all the casinos, and then the kids have the kids' day, right? Um, how is that? How is your revenue um, work as as and and how has attendance worked throughout this whole period? Well, just like every children's museum in the country, I mean, we had to shut down, um, you know, mid-March and we were closed through the end of June. And um, when we reopened, we we knew we weren't going to be anywhere near uh, regular capacity. We, we projected about 25 percent of normal capacity. But because we had an endowment and a commitment from our board that if, if we ever needed rainy day funds, let's make a commitment to this budget that we retain the staff and put our rainy day funds towards this rainy day, monitor closely, monitor expenses, uh, monitor earned revenue. Our community um, also stepped up in a major gifts way and foundation way with some you know, gifts in the very beginning of the year with the challenge fund that helped us um, you know, know that we were going to weather you know, this much time. Um, but fortunately, we were able to keep that our entire team together so that when capacity, when demand was there, we were able to meet the capacity because hiring has been such a challenge um, right now in our industry of just finding, you know, anyone who laid off staff or part-time staff um, 
we, we were in a fortunate position to have retained ours um, from the overall population. I mean, tourism makes up about 25 percent of our attendance. Tourism stopped in Las Vegas. Um, travel stopped. Um, but so fortunately, we rely heavily on our you know two million uh, person regular population um, that you know that came in. And, and for us, our Museums for All program, which offers families on public assistance a three dollar admission, those visitorship numbers were through the roof. Um, it was incredible to see um, that trust that had been built and those families taking advantage of what we had to offer during the, the, the time. So um, it's been interesting. Memberships in uh, you know an interesting place right now. We could talk for a long time, but um, fortunately, I'd say for Discovery because we had endowment and we're able to keep our staff, we're able to meet demand at this moment in time. Aileen, we're, gonna, we're going to give you the last word since we're coming mm -hmm. to the end of our time. Could you take us out on a, on a note of, of where these museums are going? Because it looks, it looks that with the uh, advent of distance learning, a lot of computer stuff going on, that these kinds of institutions where you have in-person encounters and hands-on experiences, they, they're becoming more important. How do you see this field developing and how do you see the Children's Museum of Manhattan developing over the next uh, years uh, to, to meet this moment and to provide this the value that cannot be provided through a, a, uh, an online educational experience? Yeah. And, and I appreciate your closing with that, because I think that the first question that you, know, you posed to the audience and that you know, people didn't pick the social interaction as the number one thing. I think I would be curious if, if Melissa and Sarah agree that I think that that's what families look to us most for because that was what was absolutely absent during all of the lockdowns is that there was the absence of that time to be to together to connect. And we had children who'd spent their entire lives, half their lives, you know, trapped in an apartment, right? And in, in a small New York City apartment. So I think that we're, you know, as, as has been said, uh, our audience values what we're offering and has come out, you know, and, and we've been constrained because we've been operating under session models as opposed to just, you know, come in, you know, as many people as, you know, could, would be interested in the given day in order to manage the safety, you know, challenges there. But we've seen that steady demand. Um, we've seen it increasing as whenever we're providing those opportunities. So I think that I look with great hope towards the future, knowing that, our model, you know, that works, that we have families who appreciate it and it's from families from all different backgrounds and that our funders, you know, have stood with us, um, you know, our, our guests have stood with us. And that for that reason, I do think that the, you know, the future is bright and that the online, while it was necessary for a period of time, we certainly pivoted and provided those opportunities. There's nothing that beats that in-person experience. And that's what the Children's Museums, uh, you know, across, you know, across the United States offer. So Such thank an important you. important point and so important to emphasize the skill, the dedication, the learning the collaboration that you all embody. Aileen Hefferin, CEO and Director of the Children's Museum of Manhattan, Sarah Cole, CEO of the Glazer Children's Museum in Tampa, Florida, and Melissa Kaiser, CEO at Discovery Children's Museum in Las Vegas. Thank you so much. Please thank your boards, thank your staff, thank your wonderful volunteers, thank your families, thank your funders for the work that you're doing. We so appreciate it. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Mark.